She was a wife and mother to presidents, but a lack of pretension and a sense of humor that could be self-deprecating were what endeared Barbara Bush to the American people. She stood out in a crowd with a shock of white hair that earned her the family nickname Silver Fox. It was part of Barbara Bush's determination to be herself, as she recalled in 2004 well, all, for a PBS no documentary. Joke, Who's jealous of an overweight, white-haired woman? Nobody. So I think that was in my benefit, in a way. The future first lady was born Barbara Pierce in New York City in 1925 to Marvin and Pauline Pierce. Her father was president of the McCall Corporation of Red Book and McCall Magazine fame. The family lived in Rye, New York, where Barbara grew up with three siblings. From there, she went off to Smith College. But in 1945, she dropped out to marry George Bush, who was on leave from the Navy. They had met four years earlier. The couple moved to Texas in 1948 with their first child, a son, George W. He was soon joined by a sister, Robin but she developed leukemia and died at the age of three, a tragedy that reshaped the family. Three other children followed, and Barbara went on to oversee a total of 27 moves as her husband's career took him around the world. From Texas, where he built his fortune in the oil fields, to politics and public life. In the 1960s and 70s, Barbara was by his side for two losing U.S. Senate bids, a winning campaign for a U.S. House seat, and stints as U.N. ambassador, chair of the Republican Party, and CIA director. In 1980, he ran for president and ultimately ended up as Ronald Reagan's running mate. As a political spouse, Barbara Bush's wry sense of humor endeared her to many. But she later acknowledged it didn't suit everyone. Well, I tried to behave myself, but I'm a little impulsive. So occasionally I said things I was sort of sorry I said, but I, I think I believed them. That tendency caused her trouble in 1984, when she referred to Geraldine Ferraro, the Democratic vice presidential nominee, as something that, quote, rhymes with rich. Mrs. Bush quickly apologized. She remained plain-spoken after her husband won the White House for himself in 1988. Right from the start, the new first lady set a new tone, downplaying fashion, for instance, in sharp contrast with her predecessor, Nancy Reagan. Please notice the hair, the makeup, designer clothes. <laughs> And remember, <laughs> you may never see it again. In 1989, she even wore camouflage gear on a trip to Saudi Arabia during the first Gulf War to visit with U.S. troops at Thanksgiving. Mrs. Bush also made dogs a fixture in the first family's life. Millie, their Springer Spaniel, had the run of the White House. This is pickles. Millie produced a famous litter of puppies, displayed before the Washington press corps when they were just a few days old. You really want to keep one? Well, I haven't have won that battle yet. <laughs> In time, Mrs. Bush was inspired to write a best-selling children's work titled Millie's Book. She reminisced about it in 2012 at the George W. Bush Presidential Library. And she made it over a million dollars for charity. So, right. As George says, I worked all my life, got the highest job maybe in the world, and my dog made more money. <laughs> <laughs> Writing her own book was just part of a larger campaign for literacy in America. Barbara Bush took an active role in several literacy organizations, including the one she founded. Remember, we have a new baby in the house. I have now spent more than 25 years promoting family literacy, as I truly believe that being able to read, write, and comprehend is one of the keys to a very successful, happy life, and that a literate society is important to keeping our country safe and strong. But when it came to her husband's presidency, the first lady turned political fighter. She staunchly defended his failed re-election bid in 1992 in a NewsHour interview at the Republican National Convention. 
what's the matter with Americans? You are in the be best shape of any country in the world. Don't Americans know that when you achieve peace, it costs money? Peace is costly. We ought to be willing to pay for the fact that we go to bed every single night of our life freer and safer because of George Bush. Things are turning, Judy, and they're coming to a strong economy. But we're going to have to all work for it. But it's because we have peace, and we ought to be darn grateful to George Bush. Eight years later, she was back campaigning again, this time for her son, George W. Bush, in his 2000 presidential run. Here she was in New Hampshire. Thank you for all you're doing for our boy. And in 2016, she campaigned yet again in New Hampshire with another son, Jeb, as he made his ultimately failed bid for the Republican nomination. It's great to be back in New Hampshire. People have good values. Mrs. Bush made one of her last public appearances in March with her husband and presidential scholars in College Station, Texas. Campaigner, literacy advocate, first lady, mother and wife, and as her family described Barbara Bush, their linchpin. Barbara Bush was 92 years old. In Dallas today, her eldest child, President George W. Bush, opened up about his family's loss. He sat down with the PBS Public Affairs show, In Principle, hosted by Amy Holmes and Michael Gerson, who earlier served as one of the younger President Bush's speechwriters. Mr. Bush began by discussing his father and how he was mourning. I'm very appreciative of the outpouring of uh, sympathies, particularly for my dad, you know, at age 93, he's going to miss mother. And after all, they were married for 73 years. I'm comfortable with her passing because she was comfortable with her passing. And she told me point blank, I do not fear death. I know there's a loving God. And uh, I told my, our daughters and my, some of my brothers and sisters, wow, what a beautiful, beautiful uh, lesson. I don't want to sound cavalier, but I truly am at peace. And I, I feel very blessed. And uh, uh, plus my mother, I can just hear her saying, get on with your life and do something good. <laughs> what advice did your mom give you about being president of the United States? Uh, keep your eye on the ball. Uh, keep your nose to the grindstone. Uh, and I told her that's a hell of a position to be in. <laughs> <laughs> a little awkward. <laughs> yeah. People ought to psycho babble about my relationship with my parents during the presidency, and it's natural because people haven't had a chance to ask many presidents what's it like to be president with your father being a former president and mother a former first lady. And the most uh, important thing they told me was, son, I love you and we're proud of you, which is the most important thing any parent can tell a child. So, Mr. Mm -hmm. President, did you have a chance to say goodbye to your mom? I did, yeah. Laura and I went over there and saw her at the hospital. She was doing pretty well, slightly feisty still, mm -hmm. which is a good sign. And uh, she and I used to kind of needle each other in a friendly way. And then the doctor walked in to this hospital room, and mother said, do you want to know why George W. is the way he is, doctor? And doctor kind of didn't have any choice. And, and um, mother said, because I drank and smoked when I was pregnant with him. <laughs> 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 and so <laughs> I knew she was feeling pretty good. And then a week later, she went downhill. She, she chose no, uh, didn't want to have any life-sustaining care. In other words, she was ready to move. And they made her comfortable. And I called her yesterday when I had the sense that she was ready to go. She couldn't talk back, but I told her how much I loved her. And uh, my brothers and sisters did the same thing. And then she was by dad's side. Interestingly enough, uh, he sat there for you know, four or five hours, I'm told. And a preacher came in and read the Bible, and my brother Neil read Mom's memoirs. Oh, wow. So it's a sweet scene when you think about it. And sweet. Yeah, she's had a, she had a very fortunate life and a very fortunate end in many ways. And you can watch the full interview this Friday night at 8.30 on the PBS program In Principle. And in a statement, the elder President Bush said, quote, I always knew Barbara was the most beloved woman in the world. And in fact, I used to tease her that I had a complex about that fact. We have faith that she is in heaven, and we know life will go on as she would have it. So cross the bushes off your worry list. 
And now for a deeper look at the former First Lady's life, I'm joined by C. Boyden Gray, who was White House counsel to President George H.W. Bush and remains a close personal friend to the Bush family. The Reverend Bonnie Steinroder, who served as the pastor at the church in Kenny Bunkport that the Bush family attended during their summers in Maine. And Susan Page, White House bureau chief for USA Today and the author of the upcoming book, The Matriarch, Barbara Bush and the Making of an American Dynasty, which will be out next year. And thank you all three for joining us. We do appreciate it. Boyd and Gray, I'm going to start with you. It's so remarkable to me. We just heard both Presidents Bush comments from them, one saying, we're comfortable with this. She was comfortable with her passing. We heard uh, President H.W. Bush say, cross the Bushes off your worry list. That tells you a lot about her and about her family, doesn't it? It says a great deal. She went out the way she lived her life. She did it her way. She did it honestly. She did it straightforwardly. It was a great way, a dignified way to, to, to go. And <clears throat> those of us who worked with them feel so lucky to have been exposed to such, to such love and, and, and strength. Susan, you've been working on this book, which we mentioned about uh, Barbara Bush that's coming out next year. And I, I was struck, one of the things you said, well, you said you've been struck by how she was often misperceived, underestimated by people. What did you mean by that? Well, one of the reasons I thought she deserved a uh, biography is that people had, I think, a perception of her as a warm grandmother and a, and a very soft, the national grandmother uh, with the white hair and the, and the big pearls. And that's true that she's a warm grandmother, but she was also pretty sharp. She had great political instincts. She did not hesitate to express herself and her opinions to her, her husband and her sons. Uh, and I think she was influential in the White House in a way that people perhaps didn't understand. It's not that she took over health care like mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton, but she was a voice in the ear of her husband and her son on what mattered, on what to focus on, and on who to trust. She could spot a phony a mile away. Pastor Steinroder, you met the Bushes when you were, uh, you had just begun, I think, uh, working at the, the, the church in Kennebunkport. And you said uh, it was right after 9-11. And you said Mrs. Bush came over to you, made a point of coming over to you. Talk about that, about her. Well, so it was a Sunday after 9-11. I had been scheduled to give my call sermon at the church where I would preach, everybody would vote on me. 9-11 happened on that Tuesday, so I ripped up my sermon. I showed up my first time in this church. I was so nervous. I look out in the pews, and there is the president's parents. You know, President George Bush, Barbara Bush. So I don't remember what I said. I just preached the best I could. And afterwards, she came up to me and she hugged me. And she said, your words so comforted me. I'm so glad you're our new pastor. And what I realized in that moment, it wasn't me who had comforted her. She was comforting me. And I feel like that set the tone for our whole relationship. And you told us that you went on to have a great friendship with them. Boyd and Gray, I want to come back to you. I mean, there's so many parts of her life that are really interesting. I want to go back to what Susan was saying about, about Barbara Bush's influence in the White House on her husband. How did you see that? Well, she, she was on top of everything. She didn't get involved, as Susan said, in individual policies, except very, very rarely. But she knew everything. She was politically very, very astute. And if she thought staff was not serving her husband well or that somebody was cutting corners, she would let it be known quietly but strongly. And no one ever messed around uh, when she was watching. So. She was an enormous uh, 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 watchdog for him, and she was an enormous tower of strength. She never flinched. She never blinked. And she always supported him to the fullest. It was a remarkable uh, partnership that they had. Susan, how would you, what's an example of that? And I also want to ask you about, you, you talked to us about the difficult, the painful times that she went through, and often we didn't have any idea that that was going on. You know, it's true. She, she is uh, came from a very uh, exalted uh, lineage. Uh, she had a, a direct ancestor come over on the Mayflower. She's a distant cousin to the 14th president, uh, Franklin Pierce. Um, and of course, she had lived a life of privilege and position. Uh, but she had uh, the grief and pain that uh, people have in their lives. Uh, she lost a daughter to leukemia. She had a battle with 
depression in 1975. She told me she contemplated suicide at that time. Uh, she was diagnosed with Graves' disease soon after becoming First Lady. That was something that, uh, that caused her great difficulty uh, for, up to the, to forever, till the end of her life. Uh, but in ways that she never, you know, she never complained, at least she never complained in public. She was very, she was stoic. And she told me that the struggle with depression, for instance, hmm. gave her... Which a lot of people weren't aware of. Weren't aware of. She disclosed it in her memoirs. Right. People didn't know about it at the time. Her struggle with depression gave her an empathy for people who were having trouble and that she had previously thought, just work your way out of it, just power through. And she came to learn that you really need sometimes to seek help. And she said she wished at that point she had done that. And, and Pastor Steinroder, you saw that in her, didn't you? I totally saw that in her. When Susan was saying in the beginning that people kind of misunderstood her, she was, um, yeah, she was strong and smart and kind and funny and all of those things. And I received her love. I also was scolded by her more than one time. And she just had the biggest heart and was a very compassionate and generous person. And I would just want to add, you know, a lot of people will help you if you go and ask. Barbara Bush never waited to be asked. She looked around to see where the need was, and then she stepped into that need to help other people, which is one thing that, for me, made her so unique and special. Pastor Steinroder, I want to stay with you for just a moment, because it, it, one of the things you talked to us about was how you, at some point, you, they, they invited you to many events at their home in Kennebunkport, and often you were the only Democrat there, or there would be Democrats with Republicans. How did you observe the partisanship around them? They were the most non... I know it sounds funny to say, they were the most nonpartisan people I've ever met. I mean, they knew that I was a Democrat. They never brought it up. They were friends with everybody. Their events were people like Olympia Snow, you know, former senator of Maine, what I took to be some fundraisers and my husband and I. But everyone got along. And again, um, they were just so generous in spirit. And as their pastor, I can say, they took very seriously their Christian calling to help their neighbor, to love their neighbor as themselves. And their neighbor didn't have red or blue or man or woman or whatever station you were in life. They picked their friends. They helped people because they were loving and they cared. Gordon Gray, I want you to pick up on that because, I mean, those values carried over to what, to the Bush presidency, to their, not only their four years in the White House when he was president, but the time as vice president, their time throughout their lives in public service. Well, th they were inc incredibly generous with their time and their attention, and they helped everybody in the family, in their family, everybody who worked with them, for them, in every way they could. It was the, the role model that they set was extraordinary. And I just hope that we can maintain this uh, as using her life as an example and, and 41's example. Uh, extraordinary um, uh, couple. And, but at the same time, very warm and very, and very, and very loving. And, and they, you know, as a personal matter, they helped me raise my daughter. And I'm very grateful for that. One sort of anecdote, uh, when my daughter graduated, uh, was graduating from high school, she wrote President Bush and said, would you come and speak at my graduation? And he immediately replied, yes. And then Barbara stepped in and said, no, George, you can't do that. You, you've refused to do any of your grandchildren's graduation <laughs> because you'll do that for the rest of your life and do nothing else. So you can't do it for Eliza. And, uh, and, but, that was, that, but, but, the, but the thought remained, and that was what was important. Susan, uh, on this whole business of how open they were to both political parties, and yet there was tension with this president, wasn't there? Yes. Uh, well, you know, uh, Barbara Bush was a fierce defender of her family, of, uh, of, against any critics of her husband or of her son, either son, all of her sons. But when, when Donald Trump was so caustic toward Jeb Bush during the 26 primaries, I think she found that very difficult to take, and she made it clear she didn't like that. And she expressed concerns to me in interviews in recent months about the direction of the party that she's been part of for so long. And I think one reason we see such a big outpouring today is I think other Americans think, uh, have we headed in the right direction? Can we revive some of the civility uh, that marked uh, the Bushes? 
and, and we should note that Mrs. Trump, Melania Trump, the first lady, is going to the services, but it's our understanding that President Trump is not attending. Is that correct? Well, I know that she's accepted and he has she's not yet. Has not yet, uh, so we don't know whether whether he is or not. Um, Pastor Steinroder, you, uh, you spoke, you touched on this a minute ago, her strong faith. Um, that was clearly a huge part of her life, I mean, from what you were telling us. It was a huge part of her life and of President Bush's life as well. And you could see it through everything. You could see it in their relationship. You could see it in um, the motivation that they felt to help other people, to be good people, to be kind, to be generous. We talked about faith quite a bit. Um, but she was never heavy-handed about her faith because she was, I don't know if people realize, but my experience of her is she was also very private in many ways. So she was very clear about her faith. She would help anybody, but she never tried to force her views or her beliefs on anybody else. And I do think that's probably what helped her at the end of her life to have that sense of peace because we had talked um, a long, long time ago about her beliefs that she knew she would be reunited with the people she loved who had gone before her. Borden Gray, you were in touch with the family. You, uh, I know in the, in the past you've been very close to them, but you've been getting regular reports in the last few weeks. Um, how, how did she approach the end? Well, with the same way she did life, as I said earlier, she, she wanted to, uh, to go out with the dignity that she always lived with and always exhibited, and she didn't want to be um, uh, felt sorry for. She wanted to, to, uh, to go out with the kind of grace that exemplified her life, and she did it. And it's a great example, and it's something that I hope all Americans look at because this is the way, this is the way to, to finish off a fabulous, fabulous life. And what her sons were saying, keeping her humor till the very end. Very end. Yeah. Well, Having a it... bourbon <laughs> the night before she died. <laughs> Literally the day yeah. or so before. Yeah. Well, uh, it is so wonderful to be able to remember such a remarkable woman. Boyd and Gray, Susan Page, Pastor Steinroder, thank you all very, very much. Thank you for having me.